All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us here. Uh, end of a long, a long day. We appreciate you hanging in there. Uh, so really happy to uh, have the opportunity here to introduce the next panel. And actually, I believe it's the final panel. And the topic of the panel is AI and advanced materials. Um, and so we have a number of esteemed colleagues here that are working in areas at the intersection of materials, manufacturing, artificial intelligence, and, and looking forward to a, to a good discussion here. So I think we have, um, I asked each of the, the panelists to just put together a few slides here. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them by name, and then we're going to give them the opportunity to just kind of say a little bit about them, a little bit about their organization, and how they, they interface with this topic here today. So our first colleague is James Warren. Uh, he's from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. James? All right. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, my sincere thanks to everybody who's still here. Um, so something's going on, so there's activity happening. Um, anyway, so as, as was mentioned, um, I'm, I'm at NIST, uh, and so for the, those of you who don't know NIST, um, we are the, used to be called the National Bureau of Standards, we are the Metrology Institute of the United States, um, and uh, you know, we're federal agencies. So if you could bring up the next slide, please, if possible. I, I can't, there we go. <laughs> and you can actually find the motivation for our, our, our mission in the Constitution and the, you know, Congress's mandate to set the weights and measures uh, for the United States. So we're part of the Department of Commerce, so we're the laboratories of the Department of Commerce. Actually, Commerce has been very well uh, represented at this uh, conference, and so a number of uh, uh, peers uh, are here as well. Um, it was interesting to see, you know, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership uh, mentioned, uh, as well as others. So, uh, what we're going to talk about in this panel, I would imagine, is going to push the manufacturing conversation down to the materials level, and so we're sort of bottoming out at atoms here as we finish things off. <laughs> and so we'll, uh, so let's uh, go to the last slide here. So this is just to introduce myself and uh, sort of what my focus is, right? So I am the Director of the Materials Genome Program at NIST, uh, which is um, my agency's effort to uh, enable the Materials Genome Initiative, which is a federal initiative to accelerate the discovery, design, development, and deployment of new materials in the manufactured products much faster while keeping costs low. And so the initiative has been around since 2011, and we helped formulate that initiative. Um, and you can see this Venn diagram that we constructed when we initiated the initial white paper uh, to make the MGI happen. And what you'll see there in the center of that diagram, besides the notion of computational tools experiments and digital data, which are really just the components of science and engineering, um, is how do we integrate those more tightly Right, build the infrastructure to get this acceleration done. Um, and so there's a huge number of elements in that. How can the agencies of the government work together to make that happen? And if when I listen to everything that I've heard in the last two days, you're really seeing a recapitulation of these ideas around integration of data and knowledge um, that were happening at the manufacturing level. And now you're saying, okay, well, what about the material itself? Right? Where does that fit in there? And I think you're going to hear from my colleagues uh, to my left uh, that they have solutions. And so I'll be very interested to hear what they have to say and how it all plays together and uh, how the government can make a difference. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. And um, my next colleague is Sam Kernian. He is the CEO, CEO for Core Power Magnetics. So if we could go to the next slide, please. All right. Thank you all for uh, having me here today. Really excited. Um, yeah, so Core Power Magnetics, we're a startup here based in Pittsburgh, uh, came out of Carnegie Mellon University and the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and we're making really much more compact, more energy efficient inductors, motors, and transformers like the ones you see there on the right. And so we can have these really massive weight reductions, uh, improvements in losses, all these things that really help things like electrification with EVs and renewable adoption. And this is a, a great panel to kind of bring in the core power story because we go really from the alloy composition all the way through the component design with a lot of advanced processing in between. Um, so really excited to kind of talk about how we're using those tools as we go into this. So if you go to the next slide here. I just a little bit more background on us. Yeah, again, formed in June 2020. Um, we're located in the Energy Innovation Center, which is just up the road from here. So I had a chance to walk down, which was great. 
<laughs> we have uh, over 20 grand of their pending patents. So still early on, um, just uh, finish our pre-seed raise and getting our uh, pilot plant in place. Um, so then if you go to the next slide, you know, just in terms of where we sit in this conversation and kind of put this together for the, uh, for the panel, again, I think we'll be talking a bit, as you, as you mentioned, Jim, about going all the way to the, to, down to the atom and kind of what that means. So there's been a lot of work on really improving AI tools with materials as well as at the system level. Uh, my background, even before Core Power, I was at a, a specialty alloy manufacturer for a number of years and got to see kind of how this interchange took place between these two oftentimes siloed parts of the, of the supply chain. And so you have this kind of um, improvement to these tools, a lot of the science that goes into this, but oftentimes what I like to call the mode of misunderstanding here between the materials companies and the tier ones and OEMs, that leads to much more of an evolutionary uh, type process to improvements to things like engines, motors, and everything else. And so really going forward, um, I think it's gonna be critical that we start to look at these tools kind of bridging that gap um, and so if you go to the next slide, having entities or organizations like Core Power that sit in between, that have the material expertise, not just a couple of material scientists on staff at the OEM level, or not just a couple of application engineers at the materials company level, but also having people in between that can help bridge that and bring it all together. Okay, thanks very much. And then our next uh, established uh, speaker is Aziz Asfahani from Questech. Good afternoon, and glad to be here. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, well, as my function, I'm the chairman and CEO of Questech. As background, I'm a member of uh, the U.S. National Academy of Engineers. I uh, have a degree in uh, engineering diploma in physics from Ecole Centrale, Paris, France, and a doctoral degree in material science from MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. What we do at Questech is basically design higher performance materials uh, using our integrated computational materials engineering technologies and the accelerated insertion of materials, the AIM methodology, uh, which we apply it for improved materials in uh, aerospace, uh, defense, energy, automotive, and medical. Uh, as an example or illustration of an ICME design material, this is the Ferium S53, uh, basically an, an ultra high strength alloy uh, that was the first material to be computationally designed and more important qualified for a critical safety critical component in less than half what it takes to design and high performance alloys to fly, which usually typically takes 20 years. This alloy was designed at lower cost within 11 years. Uh, it's not only for defense, uh, the material basically being stainless, eliminated the cadmium plating steps, which is a toxic cancer causing, and is used uh, on the Dragon capsule uh, landing gears for SpaceX, and actually there is a component of it, the pin uh, supporting the uh, ram air turbine for the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. So these alloys and the ICME design is a reality. Uh, we've been in business, started in 1997 uh, as a spin-off from Northwestern University with uh, Professor Greg Olson who is now a professor of the practice at MIT, and his student, uh, his doctoral degree student, uh, Dr. Charlie Kuman. And uh, over 25 years, we amassed quite a large quantities of uh, vetted and verified uh, genomic material science data sets, as well as physics-based modeling. And we're combining all of that and producing or providing uh, predictive software that can predict the properties of a finished component, whether manufactured via traditional manufacturing, but most importantly, recently for additive manufacturing. We handled over uh, 65 funded projects by outside entities in additive manufacturing, mostly to redesign 
the feedstock material, as well as to improve on the reproducibility of the process. Next slide. Uh, this technology is basically materials concurrency in support of engineering concurrency. It has been adopted by, uh, I would say, companies with visionary leadership, uh, focusing on innovation. Uh, Apple is using that technology since 2012, and uh, SpaceX, Tesla, started using it with a team focused on that in uh, 19 and uh, 2015. Actually, the best example of application of innovative materials concurrency with engineering concurrency is the Tesla Giga casting line, where they designed the new casting line to cast the body of electric vehicle in aluminum, but at the same time, they redesigned it with what should be the right aluminum to allow them to do that casting. So that's concurrency of engineering that is it being adopted, as I said, by companies focused on innovation. Next slide. We've been asked to look on how this advanced materials can assist in transition toward net zero. We have many programs that were focused on advanced materials to improve the efficiency of using fossil fuel, whether in automotive as cylinder heads for operating the cars, uh, the combust internal combustion engine at 320 degrees Fahrenheit a centigrade, which would basically improve the reduce the emission uh, was estimated at 41 percent by a major automotive company in Germany, as well as improving the efficiency of land-based gas turbines so they can operate on at a 100 degree centigrade higher where most of the existing super alloys cannot perform. So they have redesigned a high entropy refractory metal that would allow that operation and improving the efficiency of gas turbine, land-based gas turbine, as well as flying jet engine by over 32%. So these are part of the existing approach in improving the efficiency, at the same time improving the reliability of system like wind turbine, where one of the problem is really uh, issues with the upper gearbox. If it fails, it costs enormous amount of money to go up there to replace it. And our design of an advanced uh, uh, material for gears for helicopter application as approved by Sikorsky and Bell basically is applied for the type of wind turbine upper box gear application and now we're looking at a similar material that is stainless so it can be used in uh, offshore uh, wind turbines uh, generating up to 10 to 12 megawatt per unit instead of the 1 to 3 megawatt. So there's a lot of efficiency that can be improved on, as well as we're looking at redesigning a specific alloy for the fusion reactor involving a layered or graded building of the tungsten, which will be at the interface of the plasma with copper that will allow for the dissipation of the heat. So that's one example. Now all those, what we do is instead of designing an uh, discovering a metal, then figuring out, or an alloy, how you're gonna produce it. We start from the other end, working with Elon Musk when I go to Mars, but he doesn't wanna stop uh, on the moon. He wanted a better engine for his rocket. Well, there are no super alloys that would allow that right now. So you could then say, fine, to meet your requirement for a different type of uh, fuel that will allow you to have the thrust that you need Basically, we tie that with what should be the property of that material in terms of oxidation re resistance and strength. And that property would be then developed or achieved based on a specific microstructure, which is impacted by the process itself and the chemical composition. All of this is integrated to allow design of such material within five to seven months. And uh, that's a quite an achievement in terms of advanced materials that I hope many of you are interested in looking at how you're going to move forward with uh, whether reaching or toward a zero uh, uh, emission uh, of carbon, as well as improving on the processes. That technology is reality and it exists. 
Right now, all this knowledge is being put together into a platform as integrated computational materials design or ICMD platform, where basically it has a predictive soft software and we practice it for recycling uh, scrap titanium 6.4 and we were able to make out of it a cast improved or different type of 6.4 that was better than the cast typical 6.4 and that was for a Department of Defense application. So all of this technology is in existence and uh, would be uh, useful to those interested in the field of how materials can support the various innovations in manufacturing and in design. Okay, thank you very much. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, our next uh, established speaker is Josh Green. Uh, he's from Citrine Informatics. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, everybody. I think there might have been some kind of mistake. I don't know if I'm smart enough to be on this panel. I realized in the <laughs> intro that I'm the only one without a PhD, but uh, I will try to make it up maybe with a, a little bit of a business perspective on this uh, on the topic. Um, yeah, so Josh Green, I, I head up uh, partnerships and business development for Citrine Informatics. Uh, a bit of background on me, I spent 10 years in the industry. Uh, lastly, just across the river here at Alcoa, uh, working on new alloy development but really became convinced in, in 2017 that AI-driven design was gonna be the future of new materials, new chemicals, discovery and development. And uh, so jumped on board a, a startup Citrine at the time. And I, I never really saw myself particularly as a visionary, but certainly in 2017, there weren't a lot of business leaders in, in our industry that saw AI as, as an obvious uh, future step. So. You know, at that time, it was kind of a lot of evangelism, trying to convince people and leaders that this is real, it could have an impact on your business. If I fast forward that to today, it's really completely different. There's not an executive that I, I've met this year that isn't thinking about how AI can impact their business. Uh, you know, the industrial leaders are on the move. Uh, they're, they're adopting this. They're seeing how they can accelerate it. Um, you know, ourselves, we've had a couple of big multi-year announcements, uh, but much beyond that, there's lots of small companies and startups joining the space, uh, providing consulting on particular uh, niches, uh, so, uh, domains of expertise. Some are also uh, providing software as well. And there's a ton of activity of companies building their own kind of solutions that they built internally to apply AI to material discovery and design. Um, and it's it's not uh, complicated why, uh, the, the impact is not subtle. Uh, you know, we're talking about an order of magnitude different in outcomes, both in terms of speed and the, the results that you get in terms of uh, performance. And you know, with the, the huge demands that we have in terms of uh, circularity, in terms of sustainability, in terms of energy transition, I, the, the demands of materials and chemicals have never been higher and the technology has, has come up to meet that, and so it's a, it's a technology whose time has come. Uh, so to me, for me, this is, is just inevitable. This is gonna be the way materials and chemicals are, are discovered and developed, and I think you know, in, in 10 years' time, the, the companies that aren't doing this are, are gonna be relegated, relegated to commodity players, and, and the leaders in the industry are gonna be uh, leveraging this very broadly. If I transition a little bit to today's topic, and that's the next slide, uh, you know, I think the energy transition isn't a couple of moonshot problems. Uh, it's, it's thousands of problems that we have to solve. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. And by way of just a few examples uh, of the, the, the many more that are out there, if we think of uh, bio-based materials, if we want to move away from petrochemical feedstocks, uh, I'll use a technical term, there are zillions of products that are based on petrochemical feedstocks. And so this is decades of work, thousands of individual products that need to be redesigned uh, to take in different feedstocks and reformulate those products so they still have equivalent or ideally even better performance. Uh, another category is uh, carbon capture and uh, sequestration. Catalysts, uh, a number of other materials needed to do this as we go through this transition. Uh, batteries, there are hundreds of battery applications, the, the biggest of which are, are EVs. 
And to make those a reality, uh, those batteries need to be optimized for those different applications. And we need new anodes, new cathodes, new electrolytes, new coatings, and a whole supporting cast of characters to make that a reality. And I'll, the last example I want to touch on is solar materials. Maybe this is an obvious one in the energy transition is new technologies that produce energy. And uh, sharing with a, uh, zoom in on a use case that we shared with uh, Ubiquitous Energy earlier this year. And uh, as you may know, the, uh, the electromagnetic radi radiation we get from the sun is, has a broad spectrum, only a tiny sliver of which is visible to humans. So the brilliance of Ubiquitous is they've created a, a system that allows the visible spectrum to pass through perfectly clear windows. They capture other ranges of the spectrum and use that to create solar energy. And by you know, leveraging, in this case, the Citrine Club, Citrine Platforms AI, they were able to develop those coatings uh, much faster and get to much better performance. And this, it's a kind of problem that's similar in shape to many that we see. You've got a very large number of input variables that you can change, whether that be the, the ingredients, uh, the processing parameters, and you've got multiple outputs that you're trying to optimize for. Uh, performance, cost, emissions, uh, embedded carbon, and optimizing for all these simultaneously is, a, is an AI-shaped problem. And that's why I, I'm so convinced that, that this is inevitable for our industry. Lastly, I thought, uh, especially this being uh, a, a GEMIS conference sponsored by uh, our friends in the Middle East that have some of the largest uh, skyscrapers in the world, you know, the, the surface area on the top of the building isn't getting that much bigger, but certainly there's miles of windows, uh, and so this kind of solar technology, I think, is really novel and, and interesting for that application. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, so maybe to continue on that discussion, we've had some good, some good conversation in a number of different se sectors, but I think for this audience in particular, maybe um, if any of you would like to elaborate on the specific role of material science in really achieving net zero emissions targets, right? So what's... Where do you really see, so before we get into the AI development aspect, you know, where do you really see material science playing a key role here? I mean, I'm, I'm amused if I can jump in only because, Absolutely. I mean, where does it not? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's, the, it's a difficult question to answer because, I mean, you know, he generated a very nice list there, I thought, of uh, potential application spaces, but then if you drill down, uh, in each of those examples, and then ask the question, you know, are the extant materials that we have actually capable of delivering on whatever we've decided are our targets? So whether they're set by policy or by various local economic uh, considerations, uh, the materials problems are often what stands in the way of realizing these goals. So, I mean, just writ large. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, you know, whether these gentlemen have opinions, but I'm guessing that they do. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's obviously it's in everything, right? Every mm -hmm. make everything. So, but when you look at the big things like electric vehicles, renewable adoption, all of that is really enabled by things like the batteries, like the magnetics that are going in, that are driving that efficiency. I think the other key part too, though, is with the production of these materials. So, especially when you look at, at metals and steel manufacturing and how that process is contributing overall. Um, to, to CO2 emissions, how we can reduce that further. And there's a lot going on right now to, especially at the melting process, to try to take these moonshots at looking at completely new processes. But even building that in, in terms of um, leaning out existing manufacturing processes so we can cut down the number of processing <coughs> steps and consider that as well in terms of uh, really what the customers are looking for. I think Aziz, you made a good point about looking and really listening to the customer and starting with that approach and kind of going back to the start of the material design. And you know, metrics drive behavior, those requirements drive behavior, and so having that up front with customers in terms of uh, that carbon reduction or whatever that may be to uh, help improve things really will help to drive, I think, some of the processing as well as the material choices going forward. In our case, our business is material science. <laughs> we depend on material science actually in the design Computational approach is an, is an aid in a way. Uh, 
uh, specific. Uh, if you look at uh, redesigning a scandium-free aluminum alloy for high strength, well, you need to know the CALFAD and uh, material science-based data sets within that aluminum spectrum that would allow you to change from scandium to other stable phases, uh, well, cheaper and much cheaper, is zirconium as an example, mm -hmm. and it works actually at the higher temperature, it's even better to get the ductility and the strength. So it's all material science. The main difference is that within the world of large data, and artificial intelligence, uh, what you get, this is an article from the MIT Technology Review, you identify a trend, and the trend will allow you to discover newer compounds. Mm -hmm. However, that trend doesn't give you the insight on why it is this way. What we work with is with material science within that large data set, and we apply the, our program in uncertainty quantification to pick up the right data that doesn't send you astray and be within the material science field that will allow us then to look on what are the various opportunities that are economical, feasible, so as such then you eliminate using rare earth material or in the case of a single crystal uh, large turbine blade uh, nickel base alloy you are able to reduce the rhenium which is over a thousand dollars a pound from six percent to two percent and you get similar performance, and we minimize the freckling problems in making that super alloy. So all, as I said, the business we're in is in material science. In our staff, we have 22 PhDs in material science from MIT, Ohio State, Penn State, Berkeley, trying to think, uh, Stanford, and I have to remember who else, uh, uh, North Carolina State University. So. They are all material scientists working in the design. But we add to our staff 10 of master's degree that are the old metallurgy, the heat and beat, because now we have to make the prototype and the product. And now we're adding about eight more people in the field of computer science. They are PhDs, computer science, to develop the models that will make it easier now to be deciphered by a mechanical engineer or an aerospace engineer who may not have all the knowledge or in-depth knowledge of material science. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think um, a couple of the points that came up, so one of the unique things about material science is the whole process of materials discovery. I don't want to say that other disciplines are obvious in terms of the path forward, because that's not true. But I would say that in material science, it's very non-obvious what the path forward is when you're trying to discover a new material system in many cases. We have some trends that we follow. We have some past historic experience. But there's often emergent phenomena that is very difficult to predict in advance. And we have some first principles tools and others that continue to get better. So along those lines, you know, complex problem that you're trying to solve, it's going to ultimately be in a device rather than just being the material property that's, that's most important. So you know, maybe to you to start off on this one, Josh, how do you really see the AI aspect helping to drive materials discovery and you know, some of the partnerships that you've had with universities and industry to really help us move forward faster and then also not just at the materials level maybe, uh, but at the component level with the actual application of these materials? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you, you know, certainly the discovering non-obvious relationships is a, is a key part of, you know, why uh, AI is so powerful in this space uh, is, is, you know, the, the typical development cycle, I think you said this, but to, to re recapitulate what you said, you know, the very often, <laughs> the way it's done today is you take the, the last best thing that you had that worked and you, you know, try to make little tweaks to it and push it in the direction of wh wherever you're trying to design for, and you make little tweaks and see how it goes. Um, and obviously it's a, it's a long and tedious process, um, and so that's where AI can help unearth some of those, uh, you know, non-obvious connections. I think the other part, I, I really like, Sam, your uh, mode of miscommunication, I think is high? Misunderstanding. Mode of misunderstanding, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's great. One of the things that, that we showed uh, with with Siemens, who's an investor in us as well, is connecting uh, some of their uh, component design, uh, you know, Star CCM, some of the other uh, CAE tools with uh, the Supreme platform, and in that case, kind of 
co-optimizing materials and components at the same time. Uh, to again, kind of try to close that gap or, or build a bridge across that moat uh, so that you're not designing materials in isolation from the application, but you can kind of do those two together. Uh, and by you know connecting these, these different software tools, we've, we've heard that again and again today. It, it's collaboration, figuring out how to make things interoperable. We all are living in an ecosystem and uh, I think you know, those of us in, in software need to be open and collaborative in terms of how do we connect to these other technologies so that we can bridge these gaps uh, to, to get to these solutions faster. If I may give you an illustration, a typical example for those in additive manufacturing, one of the common stainless steel that people try to print it, the 3D printing, is the 17.4 pH. Now, all the data collected, it shows you a scatter all over the place. It's function of the powder lot that you use, a function of the, uh, the, the build system that you're using, a function of even the operator, whether it's a night shift or a day shift, you don't get the same data. So you could try to solve it with all collecting all the data and the trend, and the trend tells you you're not going to be able to design with the minimum design properties that you could trust. Well, material science, basically, we looked at it. What we recognize with the FEM system in the building, with the process itself, it tells you for the finished component at what point you have time temperature dependence. Based on time temperature, we use CalFAT to predict what should be the microstructure in that location. And then you take it back to see how can you address it based on the process parameters of the melting and the solidification, as well as the chemistry. So not only we fix the reproducibility problem, because the people have been addressing it the other way, trying to tweak the processing parameter to figure out which one give them more reliability based on the AI and the trend. We fix it at the level of the composition and the process, where not only you get reproducibility, more important, we redesigned it. Well, for this type of steel, you have to do a precipitation hardening, aging treatment after the component is built. Now you could do away with it, you don't need it. So that saves you time in the fabrication, but also talking about reducing emission, you don't have to use a heat treating process that use basically carbon type. So that's where material science comes into the picture instead of guessing based on a trend. Do you want more comments? We could say this is an important topic. Right? Yeah. I yeah, mean, please do. I mean, I mean, when the first time I saw a demonstration of an AI approach to materials was in 20, 15, 2014, and it, first I thought the guy was full of it, right? It didn't make any <laughs> sense at all, right? Because uh, he was like telling me the computer could figure out what phases there were in a system without knowing anything about crystallography or anything like that. And then once I understood it, it became right, radiantly clear that it was going to change everything. Uh, and so it was kind of a fairly powerful moment. And then we started to talk about self-driving labs and autonomy, and that's come up a couple of times, uh, including in the last session. Um, and I honestly believe that uh, self-driving autonomous AI-driven systems of laboratories in particular are going to change science. Uh, and so materials is just a nice example, right? We Drug discovery is an easy example. It's technically materials. Uh, it's I mean, essentially, a search space suddenly can be made enormous. So while you're still going to be relying in what Aziz was talking about in the, the large amount of established knowledge that we've built up from, you know, particularly thermodynamics, uh, which isn't going away, but at the same time, the ability to do vast numbers of experiments relatively cheaply um, is going to make a huge difference. Um, and so that's got me very excited uh, and it's going to sort of fold into many of the other topics that we've been talking about. That's a great comment. And then, uh, Sam, since you brought up this interesting idea of the mode of misunderstanding, which I know we miscommunicated that we said it was miscommunication, <laughs> but I think that the two go very much hand in hand. Right. Between so, mm -hmm. Yeah, so why don't you elaborate on that from your experience and how you, you could see AI solutions as potentially helping to address that? Sure. Well, I think Jim made a good comment just about the number of trials you can do very quickly. I know this is a very practical example, but typically you have the customer kind of coming in at a system level thinking about more of those tweaks that you mentioned as well, Josh, in terms of, you know, I want a 10% improvement here, and that just flows down the supply chain. And really with these techniques, you're able to look over such a wide space at a relatively cheap cost 
that you can really start to challenge that in a very constructive way about how they're thinking about that overall system level design. And so going from the material side with being able to look in and try to find local optimums and just thinking, okay, are you sure you're thinking about this the right way really uh, helps to kind of modify that approach. I think at the component level too, I mean, as you go further up, you get even more degrees of freedom that you can look at. And so it's it really becomes even more and more complex and building in those materials into those types of designs. Uh, like we do at Core Power, looking over a very broad uh, material uh, base of you know, looking across pretty much everything that's been produced as well as the new things that we're also coming out with really allows us to come in with an honest assessment to a customer about how to optimize uh, their particular solution. And so it's, it kind of changes how these conversations take place in a very dramatic way. And I think the companies that understand that we shouldn't be locked in to our design cycle, just setting kind of targets that we have to get to, but thinking about what are the multiple ways we can get there really allows you to uh, fully uh, fully utilize these new tools. Great. And so speaking of utilizing tools, um, you know, across this group here, I've heard a lot of representation of metals, some other complex materials. Where do you really see AI being applied today and, and having an impact across the material science space? I, I can take a first shot at sure. that. I guess that for, for our experience, the, the best and easiest place is in formulated products. Uh, so, you know, this is where very often and, and for us, a formulated product can be something uh, ranging from a paint or a coating to a uh, polypropylene compound. Uh, there's a wide variety of products that are, are formulated where you're taking a number of input materials or ingredients that are coming from a number of different suppliers, doing some processing to them and, and creating a product. And uh, those often can be iterated relatively quickly and uh, you can get quite a bit of information from those input ingredients and, and materials. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's an area where we can iterate quickly and redesign new products. Um, and so that, that is an area that's, that I think is ripe for AI. You know, metals is a lot more challenging, right? If you want to produce a new alloy, you're, you're not talking about uh, a couple of days in the lab. You're, you're talking about typically months before you can fully test from start to finish to, to see what their performance looks like. Um, so a, a low-hanging fruit for, for AI is in, in formulations. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, Any other comments? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I would just add to that. In other words, if you wanted to try to frame it, I would say that the formulations example versus the metals example could be thought of in terms of structural complexity. Um, and so if you have a homogeneous chemical system, AI is going to be really, really good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about a hierarchical system of length scales uh, like a cast alloy, it's harder. That doesn't mean it's not applicable. It's just you got more work to do. So you, you're already seeing it in chemistry. Right? It's just happening, right? And then they're starting. You know, the robots are coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I can't imagine most of the drug companies don't have pilots, if not major efforts uh, in this space, because they'd be crazy not to. Um, sometimes I'm disabused, though, when I think of these things. <laughs> so, uh, so you never, you know, one can't be certain. And then the, I guess the other example would be, uh, you know, possibly in microelectronics. Right? Again, uh, if you have atom level control, which many of these companies do, uh, you can start to think about how you would then uh, apply AIs. But I don't know if that's being done yet. They certainly have the compute power, mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think they'd be using it, but I don't know. Uh, one area we think practically it can be used in recycling uh, cast aluminum. Uh, the reason is the scrap coming from cast aluminum come from all different directions and different regions, different processes, even minor tweaking of chemistries. So trying to identify the variability of that incoming materials so rather than an engineer sitting there and accounting for each one, I think AI can help in a way identifying the variability. Hmm. And then you apply to it the uncertainty quantification to figure out when you melt it all, what is it you end with to be able to cast or recast now as a useful product, not just as a feedstock. So there is a need now for the material science in the purification of that melt. So let's say some of it could have in it iron contamination. Iron is a no-no for some classes of aluminum alloy. So it would be like what kind of precipitate you could use with the CalFET calculation 
that will capture the iron as a precipitate that is heavier than molten aluminum will fall to the bottom so you can basically end with a purified uh, product that you can be recast and may even give you better properties than the original scrap cast that came to you. So these were areas you could combine uh, or a need for AI to facilitate the integrated computational design that you need for the performance. So I think along those lines, that, that's some good key points there. So, um, you know, from your experience, when we say the words AI and we're talking about a pure artificial intelligence based approach versus a more integrated approach with physics based modeling, strategic experiments to help inform the process, I mean, how, how much do you see pure AI as having an impact in the material science field from your perspectives? And how much do you see the need for some of these other almost AI enhancements or AI fusion types of techniques? From our viewpoint, that would help us in sorting out all the data that can be put into big data system. And AI may give us some of the trends, but then we have to vet it to figure out which one makes sense because, as I said, it can lead you astray in a different direction sure. that you want it to. So we look at it as a very useful thing. Uh, but our practice is to, keep, to pick up what's relevant to us. Let's say if you're redesigning, um, a molybdenum type alloy to be ductile to be used in uh, the core of a nuclear reactor where you don't have a Fukushima type meltdown. Well, there are not that many data with AI that you could go back to. <laughs> right. So you have to go back to building that from a, a density functional theory at the atomistic level on what is it you really you expect and the bonding and the calculation of it and how you could add whatever you need to add to give you the ductility. So there are areas where uh, you're almost operating without the need for AI, mm -hmm. but in existing area on steel, aluminum, uh, there are plenty of data that AI can really help you with it. And then machine learning can come in handy for the people involved in the design because now they're training the machine learning to read the microstructure, which is a very important part. So you're not only looking at the data as numbers, you're also having an idea in uh, how it looks like or what it's going to be like. So th th there is definitely importance of that. But yeah, the, right, if right. the ultimate is really to sort out data, add data is one thing. If the ultimate to end with a useful engineered product, uh, th that, that's not going to get you there without an integrated computational design. As I think Jim said, the four Ds, hmm. discovery is good, but you want to tie it up with a design and the development for prototyping and then the deployment. Yeah, I'd add, pal, onto that a little bit, Aziz. Uh, I, I do agree with you in the main here uh, that pure AI, it does have a place, but, but very often uh, it needs to be supplemented. Uh, I, I often joke, you know, in the history of Citrine, no one's come up to us and said, we have 10 million materials data points, we'd like you to build an AI model, right? That is not a situation that we find ourselves in. We have small data, we have sparse data, mm. and so we find it's always uh, instructive and useful to add the domain knowledge of chemists, of scientists, of material scientists. And that can be like known relations, known equations, integrations with simulations with other technologies. Um, because we're, we're in a data scarce environment and kind of pulling these together and, and graphical AI models I think is really critical. I think a, a naive AI approach is, is really can be pretty limiting uh, in, in our industry. I would add a comment, which is, uh, well, first of all, I'm not sure what a pure AI approach means. Are we allowed to tell it about atoms? I mean, what are, you know, what are the, what are the, the yeah, yeah, the black box we, approach, right? Yeah. You just have a bunch of numbers and you apply an AI model to it and you see what comes out and you make decisions. So in principle, although even there, there are suppositions about yep. what that data meant. So, yep, exactly. so, but given all of that, you know, I would agree with what I, what I heard. Uh, you know, the question of how to incorporate physical knowledge into an AI in some more graceful way than it's currently being done is an active area of research mm -hmm. and fascinating. Uh, we, we, scientific AI is a word we've, or expression we've thrown around. Uh, I think that's where the future lies because somehow we want to bake in what we know and some stuff we really know. Uh, and then there's stuff maybe not so much. And so, you know, the fantasy is just that the AI will start to tell us a lot more that we don't know. Um, and that gets even beyond, of course, materials. But, you know, those of us who have been working in materials a while like to think it, 
it's pretty much everything, right? Yeah, and I think we had a couple of pre-conversations before this. I think the data is a, is a critical aspect of it, and there's almost an element of, in addition to applying it to data that we have or data that we would typically acquire, how do we go about our materials discovery process getting new data or strategically getting data that helps us to apply these tools moving forward and understanding that interplay between the two. So I think that's another area where I think we really, we really have some opportunities moving forward. Um, how about recycling? Has anybody seen any real application of AI in materials recycling, whether it's making it more efficient or more realistic or more economical? Any, any use cases there that anyone's familiar with? I gave you an example using our ICME approach, but there was a well-known type of material from one known sources of the scrap. Now, for the aluminum case, which is being worked on at the uh, University of California, Irvine, uh, the ACRC Center, they're looking at AI to help them in what they call the dynamic flow of the scrap and try to figure out the variability in it. So that's one case that I don't know all the details of mm -hmm. it, but that's one approach they're taking. Okay. Yeah, the only part I would add on that is um, maybe going back to this bio-based feedback or bio-based feedstocks a little bit. Uh, I think you know we put together a, a paper with LBNL, Ford, and BASF <coughs> on looking for discoverability of polymers that are inherently recyclable. Um, so again, this is kind of a design challenge at the very beginning, coming up with uh, polymers that will be more recyclable, kind of designing that from the outset. Um, and, and it's it's a huge challenge, and it's it's a it's a multi-year challenge. But uh, I think again, there's dozens of problems like that where we kind of need to design with that end in mind, um, and, and maybe be looking at uh, new solutions there. Thank you. Um, one more topic, and this departs a little bit from AI, but AI is going to play a role in terms of full optimization. But from your experience, you know, there's been a number of trends over the last decade or so. There was this big interest in nanomaterials, right? The, the nanotechnology initiative and lots of investment, lots of work in that area. Still a very active, thriving area. Then we saw the big additive manufacturing wave, and that's, again, very active, still growing, especially in the functional materials area. There seem to be a whole host of new opportunities coming up. Um, and now we're talking about AI being applied to material science. So you know, can, can you speak a little bit about how you see some of these convergences between these trends? So for example, let's say nanomaterials and additive manufacturing, right? Or all, both, both of them and AI. Any, any examples or use cases where we really see something you know, more than one plus one equals two coming out of these, these sorts of trends in material science? My favorite example of that is actually uh, combinatorial chemistry. Uh, which was big in like the early 2000s uh, and sort of people stopped talking about it and then AI happened, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And then suddenly I was like, oh, well now we can understand, you know, what we were measuring before, whereas before they would be building these libraries and they wouldn't quite know what to do with it. And so I, you know, I think our ability to analyze information, it, I mean, it's going to, obviously additive isn't going to be another I don't know, trivial is the wrong word, but uh, it's a manifestly uh, straightforward idea, at least, to think about the intersections of AI uh, and process control um, there and alloy design. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, the AI intersection will intersect with everything. So that one's almost a gimme. So it would be interesting if we could come up with something that wasn't with AI, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that? So what about the nanomaterials and AM side intersection? Have you seen any interesting recent trends in that space where we're not just looking at additive, especially on the functional side maybe, not just looking at pure additive manufacturing materials, but also incorporating concepts of nanotechnology and nanomaterials? I think one thing that's interesting with additive, right, it's, it can be a rapid, it's a rapid solidification process relative to the standard uh, heat and heat type processes, I think that as you mentioned before. So I think that just opens up these Metastable phases that allow you to get to that regime in new ways. And so as especially new applications develop, things like electrification and everything else, that's going to open up these maybe needs for, especially if you look at magnetics, you need typically small grain size uh, in, 
on the nano side to get you really soft magnetic materials. So there's definitely, I think, potential for some interplay there as we continue to grow. <laughs> In my presentation, we didn't use the word nanomaterials, but actually we design at the atomistic level. And once we selected the right structure of chemistry, we verify it with the atom probe to ensure that what designed at the atomistic level shows the precipitate and the constituent of the atoms constituting those precipitates and the location of it, whether it's designed to be at the grain boundary or within the bulk. So in a way, you could call it nanomaterials, but uh, you know, just terminology. So we, mm -hmm. we, we design at the atomistic level, let, let me put it this way. Sure. sure. Yeah, we just, um, so we, we actually just, uh, with, with a local material society, uh, TMS, we just went through a road mapping exercise, and we looked a lot at applications of additive to functional materials and these intersections of understanding the, the fundamental material science, understanding the local properties, understanding how when you do additively manufacture a component or a structure, how do those all come together to assemble into a performance metric? I think those are areas where there's a lot of complexity at multiple scales, and I think AI techniques definitely can help us both on the, the fundamental aspects of the building blocks, but then also how the entire assembly comes together is something where there's some opportunities. So I think we are, we're largely approaching the end of our time here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Any closing comments from the panelists here that you'd like to share before we wrap up? No? I love Jim's comment of, uh, I, I don't know of a, a good application that doesn't apply to AI. That's yeah, certainly the way I see bomber. the world. And I certainly see the, the, these big challenges in the energy transition as, as being often limited by material science. Um, and so I think these two things come together very naturally to help us uh, move through this transition in an effective way. Yeah, and I think the partnerships, the university side, the industry side, the labs coming together in the right way, the building bridges, I think we have some real opportunities. And this, I think this panel is a good example of cross-sections across that sector, too. Okay, well, thank you all very much for your time. Thanks thank you. to, to the organizers of the meeting for letting us spend time with everybody. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.